I am pleased to welcome you to this online version of the Rosenau Cleaning University and today's program which covers the changes in OSHA's hazard communication standard being brought about by OSHA's adoption of a globally harmonized system also known as GHS. Presenting today's program is Mr. William McGarvey, Philip Rosenall's Director of Training and Sustainability. Many of you already know Bill from his extensive in-service training activities that he performs on behalf of our customers. For those that do not know him, Bill has over 30 years of experience in all aspects and levels of the cleaning industry. And building upon these experiences, Bill is a recognized expert in, and frequently published in leading industry journals. Bill was also a Cleaning Management Institute certified trainer and ISSA Cleaning Industry Management Standard SIMS certification expert and a member of the Cleaning Industry Research Institute Siri. For those that have participated in past training activities with Bill, you will all agree that his mantra is excellence in training, elevating an industry one session at a time. And now for this session, I respectfully turn the program over to Mr. Bill McGarvey. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for bearing with us a little bit. We're, uh, this is our first effort at doing hosting a webinar and uh, we're actually giving some late arrivals an opportunity to join us. And our program today is on the globally harmonized system, GHS, and what it means to you. This is an awareness training, and we're providing this training so that you have the, the latest updates to the OSHA regulations. Uh, this training in no way alleviates your organization from their responsibilities under the standard. So our objectives today for this session are to understand the GHS revisions to the hazard communication standard and how they affect your workplace. By the end of our session, hopefully you'll be able to recognize the revised chemical labels and safety data sheets, and you'll also have an understanding how to read these GHS compliant labels and safety data sheets. So what is GHS? It actually stands for the Globally Harmonized System of Classification and Labeling of Chemicals. It has been developed by the United Nations and is being adopted and implemented around the world. Now, like most things that the United Nations puts forth, not everyone signs on, but at last check there were some 31 countries around the world that have signed on to this program. The goals of the GHS amendments to HAZCOM, and it's important to understand that these are amendments. OSHA did not do away with HAZCOM and start from scratch. But the goals of these amendments are to improve workplace safety, which is what OSHA has been about since it was formed in the early 1970s. Uh, hopefully we're going to lead to fewer exposures to hazards in the workplace because there will be better information available to the workers. Those communications will be more consistent from one manufacturer to another. If you look in your material safety data sheet booklet today, depending on the manufacturer, that MSDS could have a completely different look from another manufacturer. Again, with this new and improved information, there will be greater hazard awareness for the workers so that they can take the proper precautions to protect themselves. The compliance will be easier for manufacturers. Once they make this change, they're, they're safety data sheets and their other information will be standardized across the board uh, regardless of the country that they'll be selling those products in. So it will actually make their compliance easier. And it will again afford enhanced protection because again we'll have better information, more information at our fingertips so that workers can take the proper precautions. How does GHS change HASCOM? There are some new hazard classifications that OSHA has been working on for a number of years, and they saw this as an opportunity to include them in the standard. We're also going to be seeing different labels for our chemicals, and we'll take a closer look at a sample of that as we go through the presentation, as well as the SDS, the safety data sheet, which is a change from the material safety data sheet that we're more familiar with today. 
Employee training will be virtually the same as it was uh, for new employees, a new product in the inventory, and once a year refresher training. Uh, but again, it will include these new GHS components for the new labels and safety data sheets. And the written plan that each organization should have today, their hazard communication plan, will need to be updated to include these new changes. To complying with GHS HASCOM amendments, uh, most of you are on board today for this webinar because you've been made aware, maybe very recently, but you were made aware that all employees are supposed to receive this training by December 1st of this year. By June 1st of 2015, that is the date that manufacturers must be in compliance. They must have the updated labels. They must have the updated safety data sheets. Now, a lot of folks question, why are we doing the training now if it doesn't really come into effect until June 1st of 2015? The reality is that some manufacturers are ready to go with this new program today. They're really just holding back until they have, are ready to launch to their, to their customers. Other manufacturers may not be in compliance until June 1st of 2015. But the reality is that your employees may start to see some of these new labels and safety data sheets, and OSHA wants them to have a familiarity with them so that they know what they're looking at. So after the manufacturers comply by June 1st of 2015, distributors then have another six months to make sure that this information gets in the hand of the end users. So we'll be passing on those safety data sheets, those newer labels to our customers, and frankly here at the Philip Rosenau company, we're not going to be waiting on that. As we get them, we'll be making them available to the appropriate individuals. And then each of your organizations has until June 1st of 2016 to make sure that the HASCOM program has been updated to include the new GHS compliant training. Moving into hazard classifications, these are the basis for effective communication of hazards. This is, if you will, the buckets in which we put the, the hazards. We classify them such as flammables would go into one bucket, corrosives into another, and so on, so that we can treat those products appropriately. The hazard classification also identifies the specific physical and health hazards by type of hazard, degree, and severity of the hazard. Health hazards are those things that can occur to us, to our bodies, and impact our health. Physical hazards, in essence, are more what happens to our surroundings. And we'll look at these a little bit more closely here in just a few minutes. You'll also notice as we dive into these hazards a little deeply that there are categories within a hazard class. There can be subheadings, if you will. And then that information needs to be displayed on the labels and the safety data sheets so that the people that are working with the products know how to, how to work with them properly. So we now have a, a poll for you. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to John Thomas for a moment to put some questions forth. And we would ask that you give your best effort in answering the question. So as you can see there, the question reads, which of the following statements is correct regarding the new GHS standard? You can check all that may apply here. And once you've done that, you can click Submit, and we'll be able to tally the results here. And we'll report them back to you. Okay, it looks like everyone has weighed in with their response to the question.
Okay, so 82% of you felt that OSHA has incorporated the UN's GHS into its HAZCOM standard. That is correct. Uh, GHS will make HAZCOM compliance more difficult. 18% check that. It is actually supposed to make it more less difficult, actually. The uh, U.S. is the only country implementing GHS, and that is actually also false. Um, again, there are some 31 other countries around the globe that have signed on to this. Chemical classification requirements are different under GHS. 59% checked yes for that, and that is correct. Uh, because, again, there are some new classifications that have not previously been considered under HAZCOM. And hazard class is no longer based on physical and health hazards. That is also a true statement. So we had 29% that thought that was not true. So, so again, we'll just kind of run through this real quickly just to recap. OSHA has incorporated the UN's GHS into its HAZCOM standard. Uh, GHS will make HAZCOM compliance more difficult to achieve. Again, that is a false statement. U.S. the only country implementing GHS. Again, a false statement because we have other partners around the world. Chemical classification requirements are different under the revised HAZCOM standard. That is true. And HAZCOM, or hazard classification, no longer based on physical and health hazards. Again, that is false because that is exactly what they're based upon. Okay, so moving along, hazards and protective measures. It starts with identifying the physical and health hazards before we use a product. It actually starts with the manufacturers because they know the ingredients, they know what the product is set up to do, so they're the ones best suited to provide that information to us. So we find that initially on the container labels. Uh, the container label is, if you will, a snapshot of the information about that product. So we'll get a little bit of information there, but then we drill into the safety data sheet for much more detailed information. And again, we'll look at these a little more closely as we go through the presentation. Other chemical hazards. These are some of the, the new hazards that were not uh, previously included. And we start off with asphyxiation or asphyxia, which is basically just not having enough oxygen for us to continue to function. Uh, some products, some chemicals, will actually displace oxygen in an environment, uh, making it much harder for us to breathe. Uh, nitrogen is one of those products that can actually force oxygen from the area. Uh, the, the effects of this, if, it's, if we have just a little bit uh, less oxygen, it can make us a little bit sleepy. However, if that condition continues or gets worse, the, the, net, the end result can be death. Pyrophoric gases are those products that give off a gas that don't actually require a spark to ignite. Uh, some, some gases, once they come in contact with oxygen, will spontaneously combust. So this, again, is a new classification. Combustible dust is another classification. I know OSHA has been working on this for close to a decade. Uh, combustible dust tends to accumulate in an environment, and then a spark or static electricity can actually cause an explosion. Where we see this, I think, most prevalently is in the grain elevators and grain silos in the Midwest. Uh, that wheat and flour dust accumulates, and then a, a, just a static electric spark can make the entire silo blow up. I think recently, a couple of years ago in Georgia, there was a sugar plant that experienced the same, same problem. And then there's a category of hazards not otherwise classified, and these are for hazards where we, there are known physical and health hazards associated with it, but they may not have been determined under the, the statute. So it is, in essence, a catch-all for those other classifications that maybe don't fit under a, a better classification within the standard. Hazard detection and monitoring often starts with visual appearance. The old saying, if there's smoke, there must be fire is something I think we all recognize. And when we see smoke, we typically stop at what we're doing, and we try to determine the cause before we press on. The same thing should happen when we're using chemicals. If we pick up a spray bottle that's marked labeled for a glass cleaner that we know historically is blue, and today we pick it up and there's something orange in there, we should stop and try to determine what really happened there. 
Is it a new product that's not properly labeled, or did someone put the wrong product in that bottle? We also see some organizations using continuous monitoring devices. Uh, this is typically more in, in manufacturing environments where they know that there may be a risk to the, the indoor air. So they may be monitoring that routinely to make sure that the, the uh, levels don't get out of, out of sync. And then finally, for this slide, odor. Uh, again, if we've been working with products for years, we tend to get used to the odor that, that may be associated with them. So if we notice one day that that odor is different or something has changed, we should stop and determine what's really going on with this before we continue on with our work. We're now going to take a look at a GHS compliant label. And this is a, a sample of, of one that is available from OSHA. It is not what we'll probably see over the next year and a half coming from the manufacturers. I fully expect they'll have their company logo on there. They'll have a splash of color, but the, the topics that we're going to review right now have to be on that label. Starting with the product identifier, we need to know what it is by its actual trade name, not what we may call it or the, the jargon of our particular organization. Uh, we shouldn't see the blue stuff on here. It should be what the product actually is. Then we have the supplier identification. Who's the company that put this product together? Where are they located? How do we get in touch with them? Something new for our labeling are these signal words. There are two signal words. They are danger and warning. With danger being more extreme, that should certainly heighten our awareness, but we should not discount the product or the, the warnings if the word that we see in there is warning. We should really be taking a closer look and see why, why does it meet that classification. <clears throat> Excuse me. Something else that is new are these hazard pictograms. And we're going to look at these in more detail in just a, a few moments here. But these need to be on the label, and they need to be in color. OSHA wants to see that red diamond on the label because it will draw our eye to the pictogram and again, start to offer us more information about the product. We then have a hazard statements, and they will tie directly back to the pictograms. In this case, we have highly flammable liquid and vapor. That refers back to the flammability pictogram. The next line reads, may cause liver and kidney damage. Well, that tells us that this product is going to certain target organs within our body, and that refers to the human silhouette in the pictogram on the left. Again, we'll be looking at these more closely in just a few moments. These precautionary statements are very similar to some of the information that may be on your that should be on your spray bottles today. And again, we'll look at that in more detail momentarily. And then the supplemental information box is for any other information that the manufacturers may feel that we should have. One example, I think, if we, we uh, use concentrated products through a blending system from a specific manufacturer, I would not be surprised to see some wording in this box that this product must be used through our dispensing system. I'm sure they'll refer to them by name. So again, looking at this a little more closely, a little bit more blown up, we have our product identifier, supplier identification, signal word with the pictograms right above that our hazard statement right below the signal word. So all of these will be pretty close together. So again, that's that snapshot to tell us what's going on with that particular product. Again, within our precautionary statements, we'll say things around prevention, wash hands thoroughly after handling, dispose of properly, uh, response information, first aid, what to do if things do go wrong. Storage recommendations, in this case, keep container tightly closed, store in a cool, well-ventilated place, etc. And then proper disposal recommendations. And again, these are a snapshot. We'll find more information on all of these topics on the safety data sheet, which we'll look at in a few moments. And we have our hazard pictograms. And across the bottom of the screen right now, the eight pictograms that are regulated by OSHA have come up. Again, we're going to look at these in more detail. There is actually a ninth pictogram, which on the next, I'm sorry, not this slide. Again, there's our supplemental information. But now on this slide, we see the ninth, which is regulated by EPA. 
That's the Environmental Protection Agency. So if you look closely at that, when it has a dead fish and a dead tree, it means whatever this product is, if not used properly, can cause severe damage to the environment. But then we'll look at the, the OSHA pictograms in a little more detail. But right now, those that are on the left side of your screen are primarily the health hazard pictograms. And those on the right side of your screen are the physical hazards. And there's one exception, but we'll deal with that here momentarily. So here are the first two, the old skull and crossbones, which historically has meant poison or death. Uh, I kid around, it means pirates are coming. Uh, the, the, the net result here is it's bad news. When we see that skull and crossbones, it, it refers to acute toxicity, meaning that it will poison us. It will poison us very badly and very quickly. So again, we may want to read on further to see how to protect ourselves. The exclamation point pictogram on the right-hand side is more or less a catch-all for a number of different things. As you can see listed under there, we have acute toxicity but less severe. It may not mean death or short-term death. It may just mean that it's going to lead to an illness or some other problems in that regard. The product could also just be an irritant, which just makes us feel miserable. It could be a dermal sensitizer causing things like a rash or something like that, or causing people to break out if it gets on their skin. Um, again, acute toxicity harmful could be you know, making us very, very ill, up to and including death. Narcotic effects could just make our employees look like they're on some sort of narcotic because their behavior has now been altered because of the effects of the product. And then respiratory tract irritation which can mean it makes it harder for people to breathe or they, they become short of breath. So again, we need to look to see how we can best protect ourselves from these hazards. We then have one for corrosive. Uh, this corrosive pictogram can be a, a health hazard or a physical hazard. In this regard, we're talking, to it as, talking about it as a health hazard, meaning skin corrosion, serious eye damage, or eye irritation. To the right of that, we have the human silhouette with sort of a, a starburst or explosion in the chest area. And again, this means that it's really coming after our health. Could be a carcinogen, meaning a cancer causer. Could be a respiratory sensitizer, so it could make it difficult to breathe, but we may find that difficulty every time we come near that product again. Uh, reproductive toxicity, which could impact our ability to have children. Target organ toxicity, again, it's going after certain organs within the body, such as our example earlier that said liver and kidney damage. Mutagenicity basically means that our, our children or their children may be born with birth defects as a result of coming in contact with this product. And then aspiration hazard, which means that we, we vomit, but then we inhale some of that back into our lungs, which can also cause serious illness and death. We now move into the physical hazard pictograms. And on the left, we have our explosives, self-reactives, and organic peroxides. On the right are our flammables. And again, you see there are several items underneath that, those subcategories, if you will, self-reactives, pyrophoric, self-heating, emits flammable gas, and organic peroxides. So again, it's a, it's a number of items there, a number of categories. But again, we treat them all very similarly and how we store and handle the products. Then we have, again, our corrosives. In this case, they refer to it as corrosive to metal, but it could be, the product could be corrosive to other substances and would still carry the pictogram. Gases under pressure in the middle here, that's a gas cylinder. They pose a couple of different problems to us. One, it could be the gas itself that's in there, but it's also the pressure that that gas has been stored in that cylinder. If uh, things go wrong and the valve gets knocked off of that gas tank, it can become a missile that will go through a brick wall, depending on the pressure. And then oxidizers are things that emit oxygen and help items that would otherwise not burn very easily to burn. Uh, motor oil is a good example of something that, that doesn't burn very easily, but when mixed with certain oxidizers, it burns rather quickly and very hot. Those are our pictograms. This is a, a work area sign uh, example. In the bottom left, we have the old warning sign for a, a lead abatement area. 
just says lead work area poison, no smoking or eating. The new sign gives us more information. Why is it such a bad idea? Well, because it may damage fertility or the unborn child, causes damage to the central nervous system, do not eat, drink, or smoke in this area. And that comes to us from the Michigan state version of OSHA, but this is what OSHA is looking for going forward, for not just lead, but these other products that are listed here. Fortunately, the cleaning industry has been working on getting these products or these substances out of our cleaning products for quite some time. <clears throat> so container labels, all containers must be labeled. And we're going to list two ex exceptions to that rule here in a moment. But again, this is not a new piece to, to, the, uh, to the standard. We've been talking about this for years, that our spray bottles have to have proper labels on them. And once that label is on that spray bottle, that's the product that should be put in it without exception. So our exception, in this case, labels are not required on pipes and piping systems. We typically see these in a manufacturing environment, and those pipes are labeled as to what substance is going through them and the direction that it is flowing, but they're not required to have a GHS compliant label on them. And portable containers for immediate use, and this does not include spray bottles because, yes, we use them immediately, but if we fill a spray bottle today, we may be using it again tomorrow, next week, next month, depending on the product and how much of it we use from one day to the next. But one container that we do use in the cleaning industry that would fall into this category are our mop buckets. Because typically when we're done using that, that chemical to mop whatever floor we're on, we then take the bucket to the closet and we empty it, we rinse it out, and we store it properly, or perhaps we refill it with another product to go take care of another area. So as long as we are in fact emptying those mop buckets out, when we're done with them, we do not need to put labels on them. Now we're going to move into the safety data sheets. We'll talk about these for a few moments. Again, they are going to replace the MSDS that we're probably more familiar with. There is a 16-section format to the new safety data sheet, and it is very similar to the ANSI MSDS, which some chemical manufacturers have been using. So again, if you look at your MSDS compared to the 16-section format, depending on the manufacturer, it may match up very closely, but they will still have to reissue the safety data sheets by June 1st of 2015. So this shows our 16 sections that go into the safety data sheet. And I won't spend much time on this because I do have an example of a safety data sheet that takes each of these one by one. And we'll take a look at this. Now this is for a, a solvent cement. So it's a in some cases a little more harsh than most of the cleaning products we work with, but again, it's, a, it's an example for us to review. We start off with section one, which is the chemical and supplier information. What is it? Who made it? How do we get in touch with them? And you can see from our example there, we have an emergency transportation telephone number so that, again, in an emergency, we can get in touch with folks that have this information literally at their fingertips. Section two gets into the hazards identification. It starts to tell us what sort of problems we might have in working with this product. Now in the past, a lot of the MSDSs would actually go into the ingredients. But we want to know what the hazards are here. So we'll get to the ingredients, but right away we want to know what the product is, who made it, and what are the hazards associated with it. Section three gets into the composition and information on the ingredients, what's in there, what percentage, a uh, lot of good information in here. And I believe going forward, they will not be able to say well, it's a trade secret. We can't tell you what's in there. Because the reality is that only harms those of us that are using the product and when we want to find out what's in there and how to protect ourselves. If their competitors want to make their own version of the product, they'll just go and buy it, take it back to their laboratory and figure out what the ingredients are. So I think we'll see an end to that trade secret nomenclature. Section four gets into our first aid measures. How, how might we come in contact with the product and what do we do in those situations? And if I back that out, you can see contact with the eyes. What do we do? Flush eyes immediately with plenty of water, 15 minutes, seek medical advice immediately, 
Um, that water should probably be cool water. Uh, hot water won't work, and cool water is uncomfortable enough by itself. But then we talk about skin contact, inhalation, and ingestion. And again, most people are not sitting around eating or drinking their cleaning products, but when they use these products without gloves on their hands, they go on break or go to lunch, uh, go to some other meal, and they don't wash their hands, they may very well be ingesting the product. So again, Section 4 gives us our first aid measures. Section 5 talks about firefighting measures. Section 6, accidental release measures. What do we do when we have a spill? Section 7 talks about handling and storage. And where should we store it? Where should we not store it? Section 8, we'll get into exposure controls and personal protective equipment. And this tells us how much of a product we might be able to breathe or be around before it can impact our health. But more importantly, what personal protective equipment is going to help protect me if I utilize it and use it properly. Section 9 goes into physical and chemical properties. And again, if I back that heading out, you can see the first thing up there is appearance. Second thing is odor. So when we talk about identifying when things are wrong, this is a good indicator. What does it look like? What does it smell like when things are right? So those are just two of the, the pieces of information from this section that can be very helpful to us and to the people that are working with the product. Section 10 gets into the stability and reactivity of a product. Is it OK to have it sitting on the shelf for two years, or may it break down into some other hazardous ingredients? And what might it react with if things do go wrong? There's a spill couple of jugs fall off the shelf. So what should we never store it near? It kind of ties back to that storage heading, but again, the reactivity is an important thing. Section 11 gets into the toxicological information, talks about how it might poison us. Uh, again, likely routes of exposure. It says here, inhalation, eye and skin contact. So with this product, if it gets on the skin, we need to make sure we wash it off immediately. Section 12 talks about the ecological information. How might it react or interact with the environment? Section 13 gives us our disposal considerations. What is the proper way to dispose of the product when we're done with it? Section 14 gets into transportation information, which reminds me to let you know one thing that will not be changing going forward the placards that you may see on trucks going down the highway or trains on the railways, those placards are governed by the Department of Transportation. They've already got an international flavor to them, uh, but they're not impacted by this decision from OSHA. Section 15, we'll get into the regulatory information. And this can be anything from what we see here on the screen to you know, several pages, depending on the product. Um, and, and certain municipalities or other legislative districts. Uh, there are some products out there that folks do not want used within their, the confines of their, their municipality. So again, this, there's a lot of information that could end up in here. The only place you'll ever find this is on the safety data sheet. And finally, Section 16 covers any other information that maybe didn't fit in one of the other categories on the safety data sheet, but any other important information that the manufacturer feels we should have. So that concludes the safety data sheet portion of this. Uh, our next topic is employee training. And again, the requirements are the same as they were before GHS. As I stated earlier, a new employee should have this training. If you have a new product that comes into your chemical inventory, everyone should have the training. And once a year, there should be refresher training just to remind people of what the, the, today it's the MSDS, but in the future, where the SDSs are kept, what information is important on there, how to read and understand the GHS compliant label. And again, this is what is supposed to happen by December 1st of this year, which all of you are doing this right now by attending the webinar. But how to read and interpret the GHS compliant labels how to read and interpret the safety data sheets, the hazards of simple asphyxiation, combustible dust, pyrophoric gas, and hazards not otherwise classified, 
and then this GHS portion of this needs to be rolled into your right to know training or your hazard communication training as the new labels and safety data sheets start to arrive. We have one more poll for you here today just to test your understanding of what we've gone over. So here we have it. What information appears on a GHS compliant chemical product label? Your choices are supplier identification, pictogram, first aid information, product identifier, and signal word. So please take a moment and check all of those that apply. Just waiting another few moments here as the answers are tabulated. got all the answers that we're going to get. So now uh, there we go. Uh, looks like you did pretty well on that. Um, actually, all five of those items will be on a GHS compliant label. So everybody got product identifier correct because we want to know what's in there. But the supplier identification will still be part of that. The pictograms are certainly part of that. First aid information. Uh, most of your labels have that on there today, so they will have it in the future. And the signal word is part of that. Again, whether it's danger or warning, they will be on there. So again, supplier identification is a yes. Pictograms are a yes. First aid information, yes. Product identifier is a yes. And the signal word is a yes. And hopefully you didn't have to cheat off of your neighbor's paper, as the young lady is in the, in the uh, graphic here. So as we conclude, um, hopefully now you have a better understanding of hazard communication standard using GHS, globally harmonized system, uh, a little better understanding how to read the GHS chemical labels. And again, as they start to roll into to us, we're going to be sharing them with our customers. The new safety data sheet, again, we've gone over that so that you have a better understanding, hopefully, of those 16 sections. And the employee training requirements, again, new employee, new product, once a year refresher. There, is, there are two requirements for the employees around this training. They are required to attend the training and pay attention. So some key points to remember, OSHA has used GHS to modify HASCOM. Again, they didn't just start from scratch. This is an amendment or modification to a program that has been in place for almost 30 years. Uh, GHS provides standardized safety and health information. The nice thing going forward is, again, the, the labels will look very similar from one manufacturer to another, as will the safety data sheet. So we don't have to try and figure out, okay, what, what am I looking for? Where is it on this sheet or on this label? Uh, the next bullet point, implementing GHS will make workplaces and workers safer. It's just like any other piece of safety gear. It will only make us safer if we use it. If we choose to ignore it, then we can't expect any improvement in safety. Uh, GHS will make American businesses more competitive as they will be able to market their products in these partner countries around the globe and they won't have to redo or reinvent the wheel because their safety data sheets will be in compliance, their labels will be in compliance. And finally, GHS means that new chemical labels and safety data sheets will be coming to a closet near you soon, and we'll be here to help, help you through that transition and help answer any questions you may have. So at this point, we would like to ask if you have any questions right now. If you could take a moment and type in the questions, then we can try to field them here from our headquarters in Warminster and answer them. And while that's happening, uh, I would like to say that at the conclusion of the program, there will be a brief survey that will come up, and we would appreciate if you could take a few moments and uh, just complete that survey. OK, 
Okay. It doesn't look like anyone's typing in any questions, so I would encourage you, if you do have questions, please reach out to your Philip Rosenau sales rep. You can certainly reach out to me. Uh, I'm, my extension here at the office is 131, and our number 215-956-1980. So again, we'd like to thank you today for attending this webinar. Um, again, there's our phone number up there. And again, my extension is 131. I'm not always in the office, but I do check my voicemail. So if you have additional questions, by all means, please feel free to uh, reach out to me or your, your sales professional. Thank you for your attendance today. Uh, hopefully you found this webinar to be informative. And uh, ask that all of you be safe out there. Have a good day, and we thank you again.